All right, good evening. Great to see so many of you here and for joining us on this very cold and somewhat stormy day, but um, thank you for making it out tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Young Moo Kim. I'm director of the Excite Center at Drexel University, and so on behalf of us all at Drexel, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to this, our sixth learning innovation conversation. So at this wonderful new venue, the study, which has been so kind to us and such a wonderful place to hold an event. Uh, I do want to ask, we, I, there still might be some people straggling in, so uh, I, you know, I know those seats are kind of sparse, and if you wouldn't mind squeezing in just a little bit, that would be very kind of you. Thanks. <clears throat> so we're delighted to be joined tonight by a very special distinguished speaker, Dr. Melina Ankefer who will share research on the neuroscience of learning and its application for evidence-based education and pedagogy. And I know we're all super eager to hear from Melina, but first indulge me while I provide you some brief updates on the Excite Center and learning innovation. In fact, it was almost exactly one year ago that we launched this conversation series. So if you think back to that date, we had just had the biggest inauguration ever. It seems so long ago, it's so long ago. A year ago, the SRC was the governing body for the school district of Philadelphia. Uh, and a year ago, the Eagles were completely out of the playoffs. <laughs> of course, this year, we're going to the Super Bowl. So I bring this up not only because we are all super excited for the game, we are, but because I am just as excited by some of the work of the players off of the field, especially when it comes to education. There's defensive end Chris Long, who donated his entire um, game salaries to education charities for the entire season. There's offensive tackle Lane Johnson, whose t-shirts that he created, the under underdog t-shirts, uh, were created to give all proceeds to the fund for the school district of Philadelphia. And then, when the NFL created knockoff versions, he compelled them to also donate those proceeds to the School District of Philadelphia. Right. And then there's our good friend, Malcolm Jenkins, who's leading advocacy on issues of equality, criminal justice reform, and STEAM education. Uh, he supports our Young Dragons summer, summer STEAM initiative, bringing cutting edge art science programs to more than 75 children in the West Philadelphia Promise Zone. So there's a tremendous piece by Larry Platt in the Philadelphia Citizen yesterday about this team and how they represent the values of our city. So for me, this game is a, really, it's about the efforts of some extraordinary citizens who happen to do amazing things on a football field as well, but showing us novel ways to support and advance education in Philadelphia. So we kicked this off a year ago and it's been a wonderful opportunity to bring some leading thinkers and practitioners to our university to infuse our community with creative approaches to learning and to spur us to incorporate new innovative methods. We've been fortunate to host this great lineup of speakers. So a year ago, we hosted John Maida, who kicked things off talking about hybrid minds and transdisciplinary leadership. In March, we had Mimi Ito, who spoke to us about equitable education opportunities through connected learning. Followed the, uh, following that, we had Leah Beakley, who shared her experience as a maker and entrepreneur in enhancing diversity through culturally connected making. In September, we hosted Katrina Stevens, who's actually here tonight as well, uh, who advocated for greater transparency and accountability in education technology. And of course, in October, we had Chris Emden, who shared his vision for progressive, culturally relevant reality pedagogy to, re to revolutionize classrooms. Now, I'm reminding you of this, that we've come a long way, but also that you can relive all of these events by visiting our YouTube channel, which includes the full conversations and also selected highlights. In fact, let me show you exactly what that looks like. So if you just go to Google or go to your web browser and type in that URL, bit.ly slash li videos, right? It'll take you to our playlist, which has the full events, but also selected highlights. So here, if I click on one of Chris's highlights from the last event here, closed captioning is built in so you can see the text as speakers are saying it as well. Let me tell you, respectability is the enemy of progressive pedagogy. Okay, 
the, the perception of what the rules of engagement are and allowing those rules to paralyze you is what inhibits you from growing. I'll tell you a quick story. So if, I'm not going to let him tell the whole story. You, you can go back and watch the video to do that. So uh, just, again, if you missed an event or if just simply want to go back and see one of those events or see highlights, those are all of it available from that playlist, bit.ly slash li videos. Uh, another part of our Learning Innovation Initiative has been our makerspace research, and the, our team has been really hard at work on this report. Um, this is going to be a very different kind of report, maybe from other maker reports that you might have seen. It's an ethnographic study based on based on on-site visits to 30 makerspaces from a, across the country and long-form detailed interviews. It's not going to focus on equipment or whiz-bang projects or curricula, but instead will detail and explore the elements of culture and community which are critical for inclusive education urban makerspaces. So if you are interested in this work, please do sign up, if you're not already, on our mailing list for updates at our Learning Innovation website, and the full report will be available in spring 2018. But if you can't wait that long, if you need a little preview, uh, our fourth annual STEAM Education Workshop is coming up on President's Day. Uh, that is typically a school holiday. It's not a Drexel holiday. So we're working anyway, but we, we love hosting an event, um, which is free and open to all. And our speakers will include Dr. Kareem Edouard, the postdoc, who, the postdoctoral researcher who is leading our makerspace research, who will share preliminary findings of that work. This year, our keynote speaker for this event is Paula Hooper who developed the very well-known, renowned makerspace at the San Francisco Exploratorium. And she is now on the faculty of Northwestern University. So she'll be giving a keynote address, and we'll have other presentations and case studies of maker projects and STEAM projects from throughout the region. So we hope you can join us on February 19th uh, for what should be a great day focusing on making and making connections across schools, districts, and disciplines. So, I always, uh, for the for the Learning Innovation Initiative, we always send out a survey afterwards and we give you a sort of question for thought, something we're looking for a response from audience members and participants. Um, we will follow up uh, this event with an email reminder via uh, email and Twitter, uh, but we, I'm, I'm telling you the question now so you have time to think about it through tonight's presentation and beyond, which is how can this Learning Innovation Network, these the suite of activities that we are creating here, through these efforts, amplify your efforts to advance education in Philadelphia. I know that so many of you are doing really impactful, very innovative things in the classroom, in your programs, and we want to hear about those and we want to find ways to share and amplify those as well. So, and of course, at the end of the survey, uh, you can tell us if you'd like to participate in our planning sessions for as we move the Learning Innovation Network forward. So, for tonight's event, turning to tonight's event now, we have something, something new, something a little bit special. Um, it's a way to easily capture interesting moments from a presentation. So there's some information on this card here. This is a new app called Interest Point. It was developed by one of our researchers at the Excite Center, Dr. Brandon Morton. Um, I've certainly had this experience. You go to a talk, you go to a presentation, say, oh, that was a really great thought, really great idea, and you try to write it down, and by the time you've started typing, you've forgotten it, or the speaker's moved on to something else. Interest Point is an app that you can download right now at the App Store that is listening throughout the entire presentation and you can quickly capture moments and it will capture the audio, it will capture the last 10 seconds of audio. Here's what it looks like. Um, we ask permission from you at the beginning to share some of your annotation information. I'll tell you why in a second. You start it just by starting a session there. It does ask you for permission to use the microphone because it's going to listen. You can do a quick annotation with a thumbs up or a thumbs down, or you can write a note right, to remind yourself. And again, after the presentation, then you can go back and look at your notes. Here are some of my notes from last, uh, last weekend's Educon conference at Science Leadership Academy. Right? And again, then you can play. You can go back and listen to that 10 seconds of audio. You can look at your notes. The reason. Um, so, so this is a really handy way for you to sort of mark moments in a presentation or conversation. But the reason we ask you at the very beginning, when you first launch the app, will you share this information, is because of the following. Because then we can collect that information 
across a presentation, across uh, a, a talk, and identify and say, hey, look, a lot of people seem to mark this moment or around this moment, thumbs up, or you know, wrote little annotations there. Uh, and then we can identify in the presentation when that moment happened. We can aggregate that information that helps us choose highlights, that helps us kind of mark key points in the, in the presentation. So um, I hope you will, um, again, more information on this card. I hope you will try this out tonight. Uh, you can go to bit.ly slash interest point, or there's, again, you can just search in the App Store for interest point. I do apologize, it's iOS only for now. So uh, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, uh, it's available to you. Also, let me point out that the, the I, somebody told me the cell network connections in here aren't so great. So if you want to hop on Wi-Fi, there is a Wi-Fi network for you to use. That is study guest, and the password there is study215. Area code 215. That's Philly, for those of you who didn't know that. <laughs> study215. OK, and again, check out the card. But I think this is one way that the Excite Center can bring some of our unique capabilities to enhance learning and to bring uh, new perspectives on, on, on presentations and uh, learning innovation. So as usual, tonight we will be capturing the event graphically. Uh, these are recordings from previous events. Jim Nuttall from Crowley & Co. is here tonight and will also do a recording of this presentation. And we encourage you to engage with him afterwards during the reception because he does another one out there. And it's really cool. Of course, many thanks for these events. Our thanks to the reporters and editors at the Philadelphia Citizen, at Technically, and WHYY for helping us to continue to reach new communities and audiences through their coverage of learning innovation. And I especially want to thank our sponsor for this series and the Learning Innovation Initiative. That's Ember at the Spring Point. Please join me in thanking Jessica Berwin and her colleagues at Ember who have made this conversation possible. OK. Now, logistics. Following the presentation, I will kick things off as usual with a question or two. But we invite you, there will be microphones traveling down the aisles. We invite you to raise your hand and grab a microphone. Students will be passing those around. But you can also tweet your questions to at Excite Center. Um, you, we want you to tweet about the event in general, hashtag learning innovation. Um, but you can also text your questions to this number, 484-555-4158. I will give you this number again. Uh, so you have it, but you can text your questions, and of course, that will help with our question and answer session. Following the conversation, please stay for the reception so we can have a chance to get to know one another better. And of course, please, please fill out the survey that you'll get via email or via Twitter after this. Finally, I am incredibly uh, excited, I am delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening. She is an innovator in neuroscience and its applications with over 15 years of experience at the forefront of learning and memory research, focusing on how attention affects learning and memory. She received her PhD in neurobiology from the University of California at Irvine and followed that with a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University. She is now an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the University of California at San Francisco and directs the education program at Neuroscape, which is a translational neuroscience center. She is also, in her spare time, CEO of a nonprofit, the Institute for Applied Neuroscience, whose motto is Brain Science for Good. She is an authority on the relationship between technology, media, and cognitive and neural differences, co-chairing a global conference for the National Academy of Sciences on Children and Technology, and is a founding board member of the Institute of Digital Media and child development. I could go on and on, but I would just be stealing from her time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Melina Unkefer. Hi, everyone. It's cold today. I am feeling like a bad Canadian. I'm freezing. <laughs> it's wonderful I know it's wonderful to see all of you um, it's actually really an, an honor to be here and and truly a privilege it's um, you guys are doing things that are not being done elsewhere in the world and it's really really exciting to hear what's going on to hear what's happening to hear what's coming out of your brains um, and to see what we can do about it 
And um, I, I really just want to start off with kind of hearing who's in the room. I've been told that there are a lot of educators in the room. Can you raise your hand if you're an educator? Love it. If you're a K-12 educator, raise your hand. Higher ed. Oh, nice. Um, students? Nice. Great representation of students. Um, how about developers of technology? Excellent. Developers of curriculum? Wow. Very exciting. Um, what am I missing? I didn't see everybody's hand up. Um, do you have a brain? <laughs> Everybody has a brain. <laughs> yes, excellent. <laughs> so we are going to be talking about brains today. <laughs> so I'm um, talking about how your brain learns, um, but particularly what to do about it, because we're trying to build a movement here, and you folks are the ones who are doing this movement, whether you know it or not. We're really trying to transform education from the inside out. And so it's been incredibly, incredibly exciting to hear what you guys have been up to, particularly what Drexel's been up to. You guys have been really at the forefront of this learning innovation movement. Um, and so we'll talk about some efforts that um, that I've been doing over on the other side of the country, um, where it's so much warmer, <laughs> and, um, and that are very similar, actually, to what you guys are doing. And so I'm I'm super excited to be um, to be talking to you about that. Um, but I'm going to start with some um, statistics because I can't not. I'm a I'm a professor. Got to start with the stats. Um, but. Sadly, the, the stats are you know, what we know already, that we have a challenge in education, right? We have a challenge that, um, we have a number of challenges, but one of them is that we have students that drop out of our system, one student every 26 seconds. Um, and these students, so through the course of this talk, that's gonna be over 100 students that we're gonna lose from our system, lose from our ability to um, support them. And each of these students will actually make $200,000 less than um, their peers who graduate high school and a million dollars less than their um, friends who um, go on through graduating college. It's a tremendous amount of unearned potential that we're losing in just an hour, right? We're losing $138 million in unearned potential just in this talk. And that amounts over the course of the year to 1.2 million dropouts every year. It's $1.2 trillion in unearned potential, um, which, putting in perspective, is as much as we spend in welfare and warfare put together. So we're not only spending that much, but we're also losing the additional amount by just not keeping these kids in our system. So what about the kids who stay in school, right? How are we, how are we doing with that? <laughs> so we know that we're actually we're having a challenge in that domain as well. Right? Despite our very best efforts, and we all work tremendously hard, despite our very best efforts, we tend to perform below most, um, most developed nations. Right? So we know that, um, I'm sorry, these aren't the updated scores, but um, we perform almost at the bottom in math. Right? We're just above Lithuania and just above Sweden, <laughs> with Shanghai and Singapore almost always at the top. Um, we know that we're also pretty low in, um, in science and reading. So it's not just one discipline that we're having a challenge in. We're having a challenge across the board in supporting our kids. There's huge debate about what's the cause of this underperformance. We all have our ideas, and there tends to be um, a lot of, a lot of um, oh, I should tell you guys. Some of you guys know this about me. I have this condition. <laughs> it's called mild anomia, which means I sometimes have a hard time finding my words. So we might need to crowdsource some of my words. <laughs> so if you find that I'm struggling with finding a word, just throw it out there. So it's the only caveat we'll, we'll give you today. So um, the idea here is, you know, how what are our pet, pet ideas around um, what are the causes of this underperformance? Why are we losing our students? Why are we not able to support them to the same level as other developed nations? A lot of people think it's about how much we spend. We actually spend more than almost every other industrialized nation. We spend $800 billion per year on our K-12 efforts. A lot of people say it's due to our teachers being paid less. That's actually not um, on average, the case that our teachers are actually being paid to similar degrees to the countries that perform as well, um, way better than we do. Our teacher training programs tend not to be um, much different in terms of length um, for the countries that are performing way better than we are. 
our class sizes, while larger, um, in some cases are not on average that much larger than countries that perform better than we do. Um, and our kids actually don't spend um, more time or less time in school. Um, our our, our um, high school students actually spend more time than the, um, than the high school students in the developed nations that are doing a lot better than us. So what's the problem? <laughs> what's the challenge here? And how can we identify these challenges and, and fix them and support our kids in, in the ways that we know that we can? So there's a small but growing group of us, a lot of you in this room, whether you know it or not, um, and a lot of you who do know it, <laughs> are trying to solve this problem with science, um, and particularly with um, the science of learning, a deep understanding of how students learn. There are hundreds, well, 120 years of, of study on how people learn that we could potentially apply to our educational practices. And some people are trying to um, liken this movement, actually, that we're doing. All of us um, are really trying to build this movement towards more evidence-based education um, with the model of medicine, understanding that about 200 years ago, our medical practitioners really um, operated independently from the scientists. Right? And so they didn't actually have ground truth principles about what worked in medicine and what didn't. Um, and so they would use fun things like leeches and burr holes to the brain to treat things like infections. Um, but then very rapidly within syncing with practitioners of research, um, so the, the scientists who study the body, um, that very, very rapidly up-leveled the practice of medicine. And so we're thinking about what we might learn from that revolution, from um, the ability to use the science of, in our case, learning, to separate the leeches from the penicillin in education. Um, and so what I'm here to talk to you about today is that we think that education is one of our most important applied sciences absolutely one of our most important applied sciences and the future of education really will benefit from a deep and rich understanding of how people learn um, and how people learn not only from the research side of thing in the in the lab but truly how people learn in the real world and that's where you guys come in okay so what could this look like um, what we're trying to advocate for and this is this is really the crux of our movement is that it can't just be the researchers that study how people learn, it really must be you. You guys are the ones with boots on the ground. You guys are the ones that truly understand how people learn in the real world. And we need to be talking to you. And we need to be hearing from you. We need to be hearing what you have learned about how people learn in your classroom, in your school, in your district, and how that can help us as researchers really refine our research questions about how people learn. And so the idea is that if we could actually put the learning scientists in conversation with the educators in a, in a co-creative and bi-directional dialogue, that we could actually come up with really incredible solutions, really incredible innovations that we might bring to start to not only translate the science of learning into teaching practice, but then again, really also closing that loop, making this a bi-directional dialogue such that the learning scientists truly learn from you guys, the, the people who are really, really seeing it in the trenches and in all of the different contexts that are very different from the lab. And then making this be an iterative process, right? Making this be a rapid cycle prototyping process that Katrina talked about. Um, that could be something where we're actually in co-creative conversation together, creating these prototypes, testing them out in the real world, seeing what works, iterating through until we find the things that work. And so the idea here is that we don't want to place more burden on you because you guys are doing enough. You're doing everything you can. We're doing a lot. It may actually require a brand new job description. It may actually require a new type of person that mediates the conversation between the learning scientists and the teaching practice, right? And so we're actually proposing that this new person is not a researcher, not an educator, although they can come from research and come from education, but they actually get trained in the research, the practice, and the processes of engineering. Because every scientific discipline that's made an impact in the real world hasn't done so through the scientists, and often not through the practitioners, but actually through the engineers 
who understand the science, understand the problems of practice, bring the engineering um, processes to bear. I see we've got some engineers over here. <laughs> um, you can always tell the engineers that are really starting to nod when they're recognizing that they have really amazing processes that can be brought to bear on all sorts of different um, fields. And here we think that if we bring the processes and platforms of engineering into a co-creative conversation with researchers and practitioners, we could fundamentally change the relationship between learning science and teaching practice, but also fundamentally up-level our ability to support our kids. So that's what, um, that's the that's the movement that we are, that we're talking about today. Um, I want to, I want to really um, ground this in the idea that we're not just talking about a neuroscientist and a teacher being in conversation. We're talking about everybody from across the from across the entire system, right? We're talking about the instructional designers, we're talking about the curriculum designers, environmental designers, classroom management folks, the school leadership, and and the teachers. Um, and then <coughs> excuse me, on the on the scientist side, learning scientists are not just one type of it's not just the science of learning. It is the neuroscience of learning. It is the cognitive science of learning. It's the social and affective and um, all of the different types of, um, ty of, of things that go into how the brain learns in context, right? Um, and so the idea really is how do we understand, how do we use the principles of the science of learning to really um, create axes of innovation, right? To create these, these um, processes that we can use to design our education innovations around. And so we're incredibly excited um, about doing this. We're building kind of the, the field of learning engineering and so starting to define it. And I'd love to, in our conversations afterwards, love to hear your thoughts around what this might look like. Um, at first blush, what we're talking about is that a learning engineer really takes the research makes it useful. So it's something you can use in the classroom, right? Um, but then also, truly, that it needs to, again, close that loop, be that bi-directional dialogue where it allows the researchers to hear from the educators um, to help us ask better questions. Because we're asking the questions that we think are interesting, <laughs> but I cannot tell you how many of my fellow Scientists have never stepped foot in a classroom outside of their kids' classroom or outside of their when they were in school, right? And so to be studying how the brain learns without actually seeing how the brain learns in context, we call that the situated brain, is something where we really need to hear from you. Okay, so what would a learning engineer do? There are a couple of things that a learning engineer would do, and this is, again, at very high level. We can dive into the specifics in the, in the um, Q&A session. Um, but the very first thing, the very fundamental thing, is that a learning engineer really builds research practice partnerships. And what I mean by that is that they provide the processes, the engineering processes, so a lot of that is user-centered design or design thinking, right? So um, having the human, the student, at the center of designing these prototypes and processes. Um, and then really providing platforms um, to, again, create this co-creative conversation between researchers and practitioners. So to build a research practice partnership, it needs to be, it needs to have some infrastructure. It needs to have some processes to, to advance the conversation. It also needs to have some platforms to do something about it. So that's what we think um, where the learning engineering um, uh, discipline can come in really handy. Second thing is doing this at scale. So it's great for, again, one researcher and one practitioner to come together, but that's not going to impact systemic change. <laughs> what we really need to do is get researchers and their institutions and all of their friends at their institutions and all of their friends at other institutions and sometimes not their friends at other institutions. I'm building the... the um, innovation cluster that I'm building is between Stanford, Berkeley, and UCSF. So we've got, we've got a little animosity there. What's the, what's the analogous thing in Philly? Do we have one? Drexel Penn Temple. Drexel Penn Temple. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, again, we want to make sure that this is um, at the institutional level, right? So it's really about building these clusters of innovation um, around different institutions so that we can truly build this in a, in a systemic and sustainable way. Okay, 
how do we start? We start in a number of different ways. You guys have you know, a five-year start on this. You guys have been doing this in an incredible, incredible way. Um, I'll talk about a program that I've been doing, again, over on the West Coast um, that has been a really interesting um, process. We'll talk about a little bit of it today, um, but then we'll, we'll really dive into it um, again in the, in the questions. Um, so I've been taking um, just a two-pronged approach. Um, to understanding how to build and kind of cultivate these research practice partnerships. Um, the first one is really working directly with educators. So um, really starting to kind of put together the ideas around the science of learning in a way that is um, free of jargon and <laughs> using real words and um, really respecting the wisdom of practice um, and starting to understand how we might um, bring the science of learning into the teaching practice, but then again also having the teaching practice um, up-leveling and informing the science of learning. Um, the second piece is actually going directly with students, and so this is actually um, the research work that I've been doing. So this is um, typically um, the, the educator work is typically the, um, the outreach work, so a lot of teacher training um, and professional development, and then the um, work with students is my empirical research, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So I do my work um, with educators through my nonprofit that Youngmu talked about, and then I do the work with directly with students through my lab at UCSF. Okay, so let's talk about the work with educators. Um, this is really, um, it's, it's my favorite work, <laughs> truly. Really starting to get out into the classroom and hearing what teachers know um, and talking to them about what science tells us about how brains learn has been just the most exciting work that I've been doing in the last 15 years. Um, and so the process that we, that we go through is we usually start a conversation around what are some common things that we think about how people learn? And let's think about what of those um, are actually based in evidence and what of those are actually bunk. <laughs> there, there are a lot of myths of learning that are perpetuated throughout the country, throughout the world, um, that are actually either completely have no evidence around them or there's evidence to show that they're just not true and that's not how the brain learns. And so it's a really important conversation to figure out what your mental model of how people learn is and what of that is um, has some support to it and what doesn't. So it always has a very, um, it starts a very fun conversation. We'll have a little bit of that tonight. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing to start to, to dive into kind of your mental model. And so we'll, we'll do a little bit of that today. Um, we'll also then, after that, talk about some principles of science of learning, reframing our kind of ideas around how people learn using some principles of science of learning. And then we'll talk about what of those principles can actually be applied in the classroom, and then again, create those applications together. And so that's, that's the process that um, we go through with educators. We'll go through a super abbreviated version of that tonight, um, starting with some of the common myths of learning. So this is always the part of the conversation that, um, that gets really fun. Um, it can get contentious, so. Keep your, keep your fists from flying. Um, but <laughs> the important part here is, is really for us to actually start to think about um, our mental model of how people learn, right? Because um, if we have a mental model that is based on things that are actually ineffective, then that can be harmful. It could actually be perpetuating some, some harmful ideas and mindsets in our kids. And so we wanna make sure that we're, that we're protecting against, against that from happening. Um, it can also be harmful to have some of these misconceptions because it can misappropriate our resources, our very, very precious resources, right? So our resources of time, our resources of finance, our resources of people. If they're, if they're perpetuating these programs that are either ineffective or harmful, that can be causing a lot more damage than, than we know. So I always ask educators, how many, um, how many solicitations do you get per week for brain-based programs or evidence-based programs? Who gets like at least one a week? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, 
having these conversations about what are the principles of science of learning can really help us start to understand what of these programs are the leeches and what are the penicillin, right? And that's really the goal. It's not to have you know, a what works clearinghouse of, um, of education, although that would be great, um, but our intention is really that if we, understand, if we become educated consumers of, of the science of how people learn, that we can, on, you know, for ourselves, start to separate the wheat from the chaff and start to understand what are, the, what are the leeches and what are the penicillin. I won't tell you up there which are the leeches and which are the penicillin. They're all leeches. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so what's, what's the harm? I have to put this in because I always get a pushback about, you know, I don't need to have evidence-based practices to bring them into my districts um, because I know that it works. Well, do you all know the story of baby Einstein? No, interesting. They have done a really good job of keeping this out of public. <laughs> interesting. So, do you all know what baby Einstein is? So at one point, Baby Einstein um, had something like 95% of the baby DVD market, which is an interesting new market that didn't exist a while ago. Um, baby Einstein, uh, you know, the, the claim was put your baby or your child in front of this DVD and have him or her watch Baby Einstein and you will grow a little Baby Einstein, um, i.e. it will be good for your child's brain. There was a threat of a class action lawsuit a while ago because they didn't test this claim, right? They thought, what harm can we, 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 we can't really substantiate that these DVDs are making our babies smarter, but come on, what harm could it do? Turns out it did harm. And there were a, several groups of independent researchers, lots and lots of researchers that started investigating the impact of putting kids in front of TV at really early ages, found that TV exposure between ages one and three actually correlated with attention deficits um, later in life, age seven and on. Um, but very specifically, they looked at baby Einstein exposure and found that the more a child was in front of baby Einstein, the more likely they had language difficulties and delays in the future, right? That's terrifying. That's terrifying. There were millions of kids, and don't worry if you put your kids in front of them. Um, there are, it's, it's not a problem. <laughs> but, um, but the idea is that we do need to test whether these products and programs are doing harm for our kids, because they could be. Um, and so we really need to treat a lot of these products and programs that are going into our schools like medicine. We need to do empirical testing on these, on these programs just like we do on drugs. Okay, so enough of that. Let's move into the neuro myths and learning myths. This is always the, the really fun one. So, all right, I'm, I normally don't do it in this way where I tell you that it's a myth up front. We normally go through about 20 different um, ideas around learning, but in the interest of time and in the interest of reducing the tomato throwing, we're gonna do it this way. <laughs> okay, so who has ever said in their life, I am a left brain learner? How about I am a right brain learner? <laughs> yes, or I am right brained. So, this is one of, one of the more pervasive myths. Around 80% of teachers around the world, not just in the States, but around 80% of teachers um, believe that um, a more analytical child is using her left side of her brain much more than her right side. And that a creative child is using the right side of her brain much more than the left side. Completely not true. <laughs> we use 100% of our brain 100% of the time. It's like the heart. If it ever stopped working <laughs> or ever wasn't fully integrated, there would be bad consequences. <laughs> um, and so the, the same part of the same um, kind of thing around this is who believes that we use only 10% of our brain? Obviously, you're not going to raise your hand now because of how I want this. <laughs> Again, we use 100% of our brain 100% of the time. So this idea, and we can talk about why these myths are so pervasive, all of this, but um, it's patently not true. Um, and in fact, it is. it can be harmful, right? So anytime you start to label something like this, like I am a left brain learner and therefore I can't, I can't learn music, 
right? So that's where some of these myths can actually become harmful if they start to create a, a self-identity that I am this thing and therefore I am not this thing. And so it can close you down to um, additional learning opportunities. Okay. Sorry, this is, the, this is the one that always is the tomato throwing. Okay, who thinks they're a visual learner or has said that? Who thinks they're an auditory learner? And who think, thinks they're a kinesthetic learner? Excellent. So 96% of teachers around the world believe this. There is no definitive empirical evidence to support this, zero. There's even a $10,000 prize for anyone that can come up with definitive <laughs> evidence in support of learning styles. And the idea here, the, the specific learning styles theory, is that if you receive information in the preferred learning style, that you will learn that information better. And while there is some truth to that we may have a preference around how we take in information, it's not necessarily how we translate that information into making meaning out of it. And how we learn is how we make meaning out of what's coming into our brains, right? We might have a preference for how we receive that information coming into our brains, but it's ultimately what we do with that information that allows us to learn it. And why this myth is so pervasive is because it captures what every single one of us knows, which is that we all learn a little bit differently, right? There are individual differences in how people learn. But is it captured by auditory, visual, and kinesthetic? It doesn't seem to be. And as an example, one of the things that you could think about is if you were, if you were to try to teach someone how to ride a bike, and they said, I'm an auditory, I'm an auditory learner. <laughs> do you think they're gonna learn how to ride that bike the, the best if you told them how to do it um, and never gave them any kinesthetic experience? So the, the point here is that there are different ways to learn things and, and it should be tailored to the thing that we're trying to learn, right? Um, and again, why this can be so harmful is it can shut us down to other learning opportunities. It can shut us down to, if I don't see it, I'm not gonna learn it. And if I don't feel it, I'm not gonna learn it. Anyway, we can, we can go into that a lot more, but again, it describes how, it describes per, potentially a preference for how people take in information, but not necessarily how they make understanding or make meaning out of that information. And so really thinking about individual differences and in how people learn, a better way to think about those individual differences is how, they, how, how the kids think about um, the information, how they make meaning or make understanding about the information. Okay, this is a really fun one these days. Action video games. <laughs> Who thinks action video games are bad for the brain? None of the kids will, but all the parents will. Um, so this is a really, really interesting um, and, and we can, um, I don't want to take too much time on this, but this is a really, really interesting uh, idea. Um, and the idea is that we think that, you know, all of this interaction with um, action video, and, and I'm specifically saying action video games, so those unfortunately are the, the first and third person shooter games, um, which also have violence in them um, most of the time. So the violence, I'm not talking about the violence piece, um, and we can, we can talk about that offline, but the idea here is that action video games are really novel environments that you get thrown into. You have to figure out what to do. You have to identify patterns in the, in the environment um, and figure out the rules and all of this. And it actually seems that beyond just improving um, cognition around you know, hand-eye coordination and you know, visual um, discriminability, it actually seems to increase the gamer's ability to um, pay attention and maintain focus. So what we call executive functioning, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, so it seems like they actually have more efficient brain systems that allow them to exert executive control, executive attention um, over their environment, which is really interesting. And it seems to be causal. So the people who have, um, have done this research have actually taken action, taken non-gamers, and turn them into gamers, um, which isn't as bad as it sounds. It's actually um, five hours or more of action video game play per week, not per day, per week, um, <laughs> and has actually shown that their brains become more efficient in, um, again, in this executive functioning um, network. Um, 
their ability to pay attention seems to go up, their ability to filter out distractions seems to go up. All of the things that we think are good for learning um, seem to actually be boosted um, in action video gameplay. Again, um, by understanding what are the, what are the kind of um, active ingredients um, in this, we can start to um, boost up the things that are good, like the things that we were talking about, and take out some of the things that may be bad, like the violence and antisocial messaging. Um, and so there are people, researchers, who are starting to um, work with um, game developers um, to start to build these kind of pro-social action video games, which is really exciting. Um, they also seem to have better pattern recognition, right? So their ability to, to um, pull patterns out of the environment seems to actually be an incredible um, positive. The reason that I say this is not to say go have your kids all go play action video games, but rather to say that that might actually be the key, the key active ingredient, that, um, that it is about this learning to learn or this pattern recognition um, for the, um, the kids who are um, building that in their action video game play. So encouraging students to understand, look for um, patterns can potentially be a way to um, support their executive functioning system. Okay, last one, um, medium multitasking. So my family who's in the room, you might recognize this little guy. <laughs> this is um, my nephew who, so my, this is actually my whole area of research is looking at what happens when we media multitask. And it just pained me to no end <laughs> that here my little guy is on his phone while he's on his iPad playing hopefully an action video game. <laughs> but, um, so there is an increasing prevalence of people consuming multiple media streams at once. And so we wanted to see, is this related to any sort of cognitive or, or brain differences? And it turns out that people who do this a lot um, are more distractible, right? Um, they, in fact, almost every single cognitive area that we've tested, their ability to filter out distractions, their ability to stay on task, their ability to return to a task once they've been distracted, all of these things seem to actually be worse in kids, sorry, not kids, um, college students we've um, been looking at. Um, their abilities in these domains are dramatically reduced. Um, and yet, they seem to be the most confident in their multitasking abilities. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> We've actually looked in the brains of these um, college students. They actually seem to have different brains. Their attention systems seem to be different. They seem to be more reactive to attentional or to um, things that capture your attention in the environment, um, whether the external environment or even thoughts in the internal environment. And so um, don't pay attention to the graphs here, but the idea here is that um, their brains, their, their, atten their ventral attention network, which is the attention network that if the, um, if the uh, alarm system went off right now, that would be the thing that captured your attention, right? Your ventral attention system would allow your attention to be captured, um, and it seems like those systems are just always on in kids who media multitask. But we don't yet know, so the $60,000 question or the million dollar question is, is it a causal relationship, right? Is it all this media multitasking that's causing these cognitive and brain differences, or is it that people with these existing differences tend to engage with media differently, right? And so until we know that, that difference, we, we, and, and it's, a, it's a thing that we're, that we're investigating right now, but until we know that um, whether it's media multitasking that's causing these differences, um, we should maybe perhaps <laughs> mitigate the amount of time that um, we're spending in media multitasking. Okay, so I'll stop with, we have, I have like 35 of these, it's so much fun. Um, so <laughs> we'll stop with that so that we can actually start to talk about some principles of the science of learning. How much time do I have, by the way? Ah, fun, okay, we'll do this fast. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some principles of how the brain learns, super high level, we'll not talk about neurotransmitters or anything, we'll just talk about the stages of learning and what we might um, do to um, kind of leverage um, teaching principles at each of these stages. So, first stage of learning, we're actually experiencing the event, right? We're encoding the, um, the experience that we're having. The second is we have to store it, right, in mind. And then the third, we have to access it the right information at the right time, right? We need to know where to find it and know what to do with it. 
So we'll talk about how, very again, at a very high level, how the brain learns um, at the encoding stage, um, at the um, storage stage, and at the retrieval stage, but specifically to talk about the implications for practice. OK, so very, very cartoony. Don't judge me, any of the neuroscientists in here. Um, the idea here is that, um, that we're experiencing our life right now um, in multiple parts, multiple networks of our brain, right? So in order for us to see what's on the screen, there are certain networks that are active in order for us to hear and understand and feel what's going on. A lot of these different parts of the brain are being active to allow us to really um, feel this event and be in this event, right? And so the idea is that there's a structure sitting in the center of the brain called the hippocampus um, that's actually sitting there like a microphone, just kind of listening to everything that's going on, all of this brain activity that's going on throughout the cortex. Um, and it's just sitting there recording over time, kind of like your, your app. <laughs> that's actually a good, that's a good little analogy. I love that. Um, so it's, it's sitting there listening and recording over time. But what it needs to know is, again, when should I give a thumbs up? When should I give a thumbs down? And when should I cache the memory? And so there are, there are um, ways, well, we'll get to that in a second. But <laughs> sorry, I should not take this too far. Um, OK. so. Uh, Dan Willingham, as um, a, a lot of you know and love, um, he has a really great quote that says that learning is the residue of experience, right? And so what he actually means is that the hippocampus is sitting there actually truly recording the experience and that in order to access this residue, we need to access, we need to engage the hippocampus. And so there are things that can actually support the hippocampus to encode things into memory, and there are things that actually increase the residue, <laughs> right? Um, and so we'll talk about that in a second. And finally, again, we need to know where the information is, how to retrieve it at the right time. So what the hippocampus does at this point is it actually reactivates the different parts of the brain that were active during that learning event. And so to the degree that you can activate those different parts of the brain, then you can actually remember the different parts of learning. So learning, um, learning happens um, when the hippocampus is reactivating what's happening throughout the brain. OK, so we have practices that we can use to leverage um, this understanding at each of these stages. And again, none of this is meant to be prescriptive, right? So all of this is meant to give you and us principles that we can use to bring into our classrooms that we can design our own innovations around that might be specific to our specific context. So again, don't take any of these as prescriptive um, solutions, but rather as generative principles that you can bring in and do what you'd like with them. OK, so let's talk about um, practices that help us lay down strong memories, practices that help us store those memories better, and then practices that help us access the right information at the right time. All right, so this is the application side of things. Um, so again, we have our cartoony brain um, that seems to be active, allowing us to experience the event. So anything that can boost that signal, boost the brain signal, Right, increases the residue <laughs> of experience, um, and will then give the hippocampus more activity to encode into memory. And that way, it'll be a stronger, richer, longer lasting memory. So there are things that you can do to increase your brain activity right now. <laughs> um, things like paying attention, right? So a lot of these, all of these, you already know. This just tells you why it works. So when you pay attention to an experience, that, act, that increases the signal, increases the brain signal in, um, in those parts of the brain that are allowing you to experience that event. When you make meaning out of what you're hearing or seeing or feeling, that increases the brain activity. Um, when you make it socially relevant, particularly for adolescents, and as your local researchers, Larry Steinberg, um, like to say um, adolescence is about between 10 years old and 25 years old. No? <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, so anytime you um, make something socially relevant or bring some sort of social component to that, that also activates um, more of the brain um, or activates the, the parts of the brain that are active even more. Um, also self-relevance, so the brain is most interested in itself. Um, and so all of these things can, again, be um, uh, axes of innovation that you can bring into um, to activate the more signals. So again, that the hippocampus has more signal to encode into memory. 
All right, one thing to just keep in mind, um, because this does tend to be one of our um, common misconceptions of memory, is we often do as much as we can um, to make learning easy for our kids, right? That's almost, for me, that was my primary goal. And I'm not talking about kids with learning different disabilities. I'm talking about um, in, our, in our general kind of ways that we engage with students, we often try to make learning as easy as possible. But when learning is really easy, right, their brain is less activated. Right? And so if their brain is less activated, if they're not engaged as much, then they actually, the hippocampus has less signal to encode into memory, and therefore it may actually be creating weak memories that may not be very long lasting. And so this, um, this, this, oh, we need to crowdsource, um, this propensity to, thank you, um, to make learning as easy as possible may not actually be doing tremendous service to our students. Um, and actually what we want to be doing is making learning just a little bit harder. Not so hard that, it's, that they'll bail out, but not so easy that their brain is not activated, but finding um, what people have called the zone of proximal difficulty um, to ensure that their brain is actually, that the activity is really um, being engaged. And then again, more activity in the cortex, and more activity um, can, picked, can get picked up into, um, in, into the hippocampus to build these stronger, richer, longer lasting memories. Okay, so we want to give the hippocampus lots of signal to, um, to record. And so again, the, this is the idea, the neurobiological idea behind the desirable difficulties that you've probably heard people talk about or productive struggle, right? Okay. So this brings up another myth of learning, which I'm actually not gonna go into because this, this ends up um, having a, a really long conversation. But the most common, um, study techniques that a lot of our kids are using, including me when I was studying, um, is rereading the material, um, highlighting everything, <laughs> everything, um, and cramming. So these are some of the most, if not the three most common um, strategies that students use, but it actually creates these really weak um, and short-lived memories. And so while it might be helpful for them on the test, um, it may, thank you, um, it may not actually create durable, longer lasting memories. Doesn't mean you should not reread. It doesn't mean you should not highlight. It means you should do it strategically where you're actually thinking about what you're rereading and what you're highlighting. Okay, so this may make short, um, Memories. Um, we do have some recommendations and guidelines. Happy to provide them um, to you. Uh, we don't have handouts today, but happy to provide you guys um, links to handouts. Um, there are very quickly, there are things that you can do to support the hippocampus in encoding deeper, richer, longer lasting memories. Again, it's sitting there recording everything. Um, there we go. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> um, so there are things that actually, so the hippocampus is one of the only structures in the brain that actually grows new cells when you're an adult. Um, one of the things that may promote that is aerobic exercise. Um, there's a whole theory around um, a specific amounts of aerobic exercise will actually release a trophic factor in your brain for a certain period of time, making your brain a little bit more plastic. So we're actually, um, there, are, there are schools and districts that are looking at what happens if you actually put gym class in front of math class. Does that make the brain more plastic and available to learn math more easily? Which is a great question, <laughs> we don't know, but we're testing. Um, sleep is actually something that is, that the hippocampus is incredibly, so what the hippocampus is doing during sleep is it's actually replaying the events of the day and figuring out which are the important ones and which are the not important ones and cashing out the not important ones and then solidifying the important ones. It's kind of like putting jello in a fridge, right? It starts out really, really wet and um, you put it in and it's a lot stronger and a lot longer lasting. Um, that's what sleep does for learning. And so it's one of the reasons why it's incredibly important for our kids to be getting sleep, not just so that they're awake and alert when they show up at school, but actually so that when they sleep, they can solidify the learnings that happen throughout the day. Time is also one of them. Okay, I'm gonna blaze through this again. Um, there are some recommendations um, we can send to you guys. 
Um, there are also some things around um, retrieval that you can do to basically what you want to do for a retrieval is practice retrieving. The more you actually practice retrieving, the easier it is for you to retrieve that information, not only because you're engaging with the information more, but you're actually literally changing the nature of the memory. What it's doing is it starts to interrupt forgetting, but it also really solidifies the nature of the learning. So what it literally does is actually build paths through the different parts of the learning process to build it in a, in a really, really deep and rich way. So it literally changes the structure of the learning. Um, when you practice retrieving it. You have to forget it just a little bit so that you're retrieving it from long-term memory, not just from your short-term memory. Um, and so a lot of people want to, are asking for, okay, so do I need, to, I need to practice retrieving every 30 minutes, every day, every two weeks? Yes. <laughs> um, there's no prescription there. It'll depend on the information um, and it'll depend on how, um, how deeply engaged you are with the information and how uh, quickly you forget it. We can talk about that afterwards. Okay, so again, there are some practices for that. I'm gonna go super quickly through the research that I do with students um, because it's a, it's a really interesting topic, but we'll just do it in a really high level. Um, so it's about how we actually um, are paying attention how we're filtering out distractions, how we are engaging with the world in what we call a top-down way or a goal-directed way. There are parts of the brain that are involved, there are networks in the brain that are involved in executive functioning, um, which, which is the umbrella term that nobody really knows who we mean when we talk about it. We specifically mean our ability to pay attention, our ability to hold information in mind, our ability to um, manage multiple goals at once. So these are the, um, the various buckets that we classify executive function um, with. These seem to be the core cognitive capacities that allow us to do everything, <laughs> not everything, most things. Um, and so we think that they are um, excessively important in learning in academic environments. In, and we're specifically looking at um, how executive functioning supports math learning as well as reading learning. There's a huge, huge literature now and growing literature around executive functioning um, and that it is incredibly predictive of um, academic success uh, and all sorts of ways, um, as well as life outcomes in later adulthood in all sorts of ways. Um, there's been a lot of work looking at executive functioning in early childhood and in adolescence, but not as much in middle childhood, so about between ages of seven and 10, uh, seven and 12. And so that's the age period that I've been focusing on in the last couple of years. So have a study um, in the second year of a longitudinal study looking at um, over a thousand students, um, looking at ways to really highly um, in high dimension, very precisely map their executive function, um, and then see, we haven't, we haven't done it yet, but to see whether we can actually build their executive function in certain ways. Um, and we specifically use technologies um, to help us do that. Um, we'll be deploying that in a couple of weeks, so I'll come back, I'll come back next year and report out. <laughs> um, so we have, we have built these in-house measures um, that give us, that, that look like games to the, to the kids, um, but are actually really high precision cognitive assessments and give us a really rich map of their cognitive kind of profile. Um, we can bring that down into what does their attention look like? What does their um, working memory look like or their ability to hold information in mind? And then what are their kind of abilities to, to manage multiple tasks or goals? With the idea being, can we build this personalized profile that might allow us to, in a personalized way, train their executive function? Again, using various um, technologies so far, but one thing that you all know is that school itself, and there was just a recent study that showed that school itself is an executive function training program. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> um, so you all are being executive function trainers to our kids in a, in a very deep way. Um, but we want to specifically be able to identify those kids who have challenges in executive function and give them personalized um, support 
such that hopefully we can um, improve their ability across the board in academics just by building these core cognitive capacities. Again, we haven't, um, we are in the second year of the study mapping their executive function. We're gonna be deploying the executive function training program, um, hopefully, hopefully uh, in about a month in these 1200 kids. So the idea here is that we think and there's a lot of evidence to support that executive functioning may actually be one of the primary keys to academic success. And if we can get a way to understand each kid's executive function profile and then give them personalized support in building these core cognitive capacities, that might give us a huge leg up in really supporting them in their um, academic efforts. All right. So. I did it on time. <laughs> All right, so the key take home, um, again, is that we, again, really need to build this bi-directional dialogue between the researchers um, and the educators um, who are, again, the ones that are observing how people learn, um, and that if we treat education as an important applied science, that may actually help us up-level the practice um, of teaching, but also start to really understand how we might innovate in a much more effective and efficient way. Um, and that if we actually start to try to solve some of our challenges with science and engineering, um, this might actually give us a process and some principles by which to do so. Um, and so thinking about these science of learning principles as the kind of axes of innovation that we use as um, things to take the principle into our specific classroom or school or district and design it for our specific context, that that might actually be a way to advance in a very deep and, um, and fast way. And this may require a new job description that we're calling a learning engineer, again, that bridges the gap between the scientists and the educators in a bi-directional way. All right, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask. I here, was going to so say. I'm, I'm, having, I'm having difficulties <laughs> with my executive function. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to end my annotation session on here, <laughs> but I'm going to pick up this other device. So, um, of course, uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, sorry, we're going to have to be a slightly abbreviated Q&A session. That's okay. Um, but please do send us your questions via Twitter at Excite Center. Um, the number you can text your questions to is right there, and I'll be following along here. And then, of course, if you have a live in the real world person <laughs> question, uh, we have our students who will uh, run with microphones. So I will kick things off real quick, um, just because uh, you know so many things that you um, you you started talking about, and of course, I know we, we have limited time, um, but can you give us a little more detail about your experience in, in developing learning engineers? What does that look mm, like? What's, what are question. some of those key, key components to that? Yeah, so it's such a good question, and you know, there, there are going to be a lot of entry points to, um, to a learning engineering um, kind of realization. Um, most of the folks that have been really interested in learning engineering have been from the educator side. And so we have, um, we have a lot of, we have a, a, a deep program um, that is specifically designed for educators um, to start to um, really start to understand the problems of practice that they would be um, attempting to you know, design these education innovations around. Um, and then what would be the principles of science of learning that they could use and bring into um, those solutions to these problems of practice. And so right now, at least, it seems like a lot of the, the engineers that we've been training are from the educator side. We're hoping to um, start to bring more researchers into this conversation, um, not just as a researcher, but as a researcher who'd like to actually move into engineering um, to start to bring their research background um, into understanding the, the engineering process and really starting to get out into the classroom and understanding the problems of practice. Fantastic. I saw a hand shoot up back there. Yes. Yeah. So, Frank. Mm, that's <laughs> our colleague, Frank Lee. Um, Malia, fantastic presentation. Um, this question might be out of the scope of your presentation, so feel free to pass on it. <laughs> but I was fascinated by the fact that um, your analogy to medicine and how we could use that model 
to improve education. But I feel like there is a deep structural issues with the U.S. educational system that would limit something like that. So for example, within medicine, we don't have medical school that's teaching that liver is not important, right? right? But mm -hmm. we have school districts in the U.S. that basically is against evolution. Another key concept that most scientists accept. So I'm wondering whether, even if we have this body of knowledge that you create that shows this is how we best should educate kids, yep. I'm not sure how that's going to properly propagate throughout the educational system for, for yeah. improvement. It's a beautiful question um, and is something that keeps me up at night. Um, and it, it is, it's gonna take all of us, right? So we have to build a movement. It has to be that we are the ones that start to say, we, this is what we need and this is how we need to do it. Um, and so it, it can start with in-service teachers, in-service researchers, um, but it really needs to get out into pre-service teacher preparation programs and research preparation programs um, so that we can start this from, you know, from the ground up. Um, we also need to have it, I think, from, you know, I think we need to attack it from multiple perspectives, not just from kind of this, this grassroots level movement that, that we're doing, but also from a systems level perspective. And so um, hopefully there will be, <laughs> well, I won't, I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> And so, so there are folks that are actually um, doing really incredible work on the teacher preparation side. Um, so there's a, an organization called Deans for Impact that is work that are working with. Um, I think they're in 30 um, schools of you know, graduate schools of education and teacher preparation programs um, that are bringing these science of learning principles into the foundational kind of teachings um, for teacher preparation. So it's going to you know we, it is a it is a large and complex system. We're going to need a large and complex solution to it. So it's a it's a great question. Um, but again, this is why we need we need all of us to to be doing it together. So I'm going to take one from Twitter, and then we'll take one from out here, So because I like this, which <laughs> kind of follows on the previous one. Um, what do you think is the bigger problem, <clears throat> the metrics we apply to learning themselves, mm. or that we take those results as prophecy-like future predictors? Mm. God, such a good question. Um, uh, both, to be honest, but um, that was why you know we were talking about the the common misconceptions of learning are can be so devastating because we don't say. I did bad on that math test. We say, I'm not good at math, right? It, we identify with these metrics and bring it into our personal conversation about who we are and how we show up as a learner and how we show up in the world. And so that's why it's so absolutely devastating to have these static categorical views, right? But what's interesting is we don't have a lot of people, so we have a lot of people who say, I'm, I'm bad at math or I'm not a math person. But we don't have a lot of people who say, I'm not a reader. Well, I guess we do. Um, but I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not a reading person, right? They, we, tend not, we tend to have different things that we bring into our personalities and into our mindsets of who we are and how we show up. And so it's a really interesting um, thing to think about and thing to watch your own language around um, about when you're saying, I am this because you saw a metric. Um, because that metric should be a dipstick metric, right? It should be something that just shows you where you are right now. Not, oh, not dipstick as, dang, that's a bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, uh, dipstick of time. like where, yeah. <laughs> not like you are a dipstick. <laughs> um, anyhow, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I saw hands go right up. Can, let's see, um, Aaron, can we get a microphone there? Hello. Hi. So is it a myth or is it, is it an area that just hasn't been adequately researched yet that being in a positive mood state or a positive mm -hmm. affective state or environment yeah. uh, enhances attention and perhaps then learning? Yeah, great question. So it's, it's certainly under, um, understudied, but what we do know um, is that um, when you're, let's say, not in a negative state, so a negative state or however you want to define that, but there are lots of states that can actually, um, that can eat up your executive function. They can eat up your, um, your attention, right? So if you're a kid that's just, you know, walked through a really violent part of town to get to school, 
your attention is monitoring external threat, right? And monitoring your internal um, response to that. And so that's where your attention is being captured or being grabbed. And so your attention, it's not that you don't have attention, it's that it's just not being allocated to what the teachers want them to be learning, right? And so, and that's actually another thing. When we start to talk about executive function, it's really important to not say that kid has no executive function, right? Every kid has executive function. It's just how they're allocating it, how, where they're putting their attention, right? And so, again, that's where our language can, can start to um, pigeonhole people if, we, if we're not really careful with it. That's a great question. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. I'm Lena. Um, I am a pre-service teacher. Yay. So it's great to hear you talking about the need for pre-service teachers being involved. It's great to be part of the movement. Yeah. I have a question specifically about video, mm. video in the classroom. Um, I understand that a lot of students view videos and then, as you described, they get the feeling that they understand the material, but the encoding isn't happening. So I'm wondering, how should we respond to this phenomenon? What should teachers do on the role of video in the classroom? Yeah. And how can we make or prompt better encoding? Such a great question. Um, I want to be very, very clear that I'm not saying that technology is good or technology is bad. Technology is a tool, and we can use it for good or we can use it for bad. <laughs> and so a lot of the research is telling us that when we use technology as a way to interact, as a way to have dialogue, whether in the family um, or in the classroom, that is where technology becomes an incredibly, incredibly powerful teaching and learning tool. And so I would encourage um, you know, any sort of video interactions in the classroom to have that, have that actually be, the, um, be a way to engage in conversation, not just to, to teach the material where you don't have to, where the video teaches the material, but actually using that as a cue to engage in deeper dialogue, again, activating the brain um, in, in more and more ways. Um, and so whether that means, you know, there, there are all sorts of ways that you can do that, and we can talk about that offline. But again, using, remembering that technology is a tool as long as, um, and it can be supportive as long as you're using that tool to support in increased engagement, whether it's engagement with each other, um, or engagement with the material, or engagement with you, or engagement um, you know, in, in other sorts of ways. Great question. Yeah, I'm gonna more f go from that for a question from, t uh, from the text here. Is there a difference between media multitasking and generic multitasking? Great question. And are there appropriate interventions that are si similar or different? Yeah, so it's, it's a distinction that people don't often pick, to up, pick up, so I'm really happy that they did. Absolutely, there's a distinction between media multitasking and multitasking um, in terms of how we're studying it. So we all multitask all the time, right? So I'm multitasking right now with by talking to you and moving my hands. That's actually multitasking, right? But that's not what we mean when we talk about multitasking. Um, and it's certainly not what we mean when we talk about media multitasking. And so we can do all sorts of things, all sorts of you know, multiple tasks at the same time, as long as they don't interfere with each other, right? So walking and talking most of the time doesn't interfere, <laughs> although talking and driving. <laughs> um, so the idea is that when you're requiring the same resources, like your attention, um, and, you, and you divide that between multiple tasks, that does seem to be um, unsupportive of deep learning, right? And so there was, um, there's a great study um, back in, uh, I think maybe 15 years ago, showing that um, if you put college kids in a brain scanner and have them learn some information while they're also doing another task, so this is not media multitasking, this is just straight multitasking, um, that a different part of their brain is learning. It's not the hippocampus that allows for this deep and rich, flexible encoding into memory. It's a different part of the brain, the striatum, that um, allows for more rigid learning, right? And so they were actually learning the material, but they were le learning it differently because they were dividing their attention. And so it's a, re and, and there's all sorts of follow-up. This was actually the, um, the, uh, 
topic of my dissertation, <laughs> how do we learn under conditions of divided attention? Because that is an incredibly pervasive thing that happens, not necessarily just with media. Um, but we think that there may be something special about multitasking with media. Um, and we specifically think that social media might have an even more special um, categorization because of the um, continued engagement and the continued reward that you get from social media, that it may, it may and again, we haven't tested this, it may be shifting our brains um, in ways um, that encourage us to, to explore our environments more rather than, um, so there's this, this balance that your brain does between exploration and exploitation, which is a terrible word for it, but it's basically, um, you know, on the one side, how do we how do we navigate our environment, look and and find the the rewards in our environment in an exploratory way? But then once we find a thing that's particularly rewarding, how do we then attend to that and you know dive dive more deeply into that particular reward thing? Um, we think that so engaging with social media, particularly in a in a multitasking way, may actually be shifting us more towards exploratory biases in sampling our world. Um, <coughs> We're, anyway, we'll keep it. I'll keep it at that. But, okay. but again, we don't have we don't have enough data to tell us whether it's it's truly causing this difference, um, or whether people who have this dif difference seem to be engaging in media multitasking more. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of requests um, coming in uh, to share some of the strategies that you alluded to, sure. and also if you have a list of those you know neuro <laughs> myths. Yep. So I will say this: we will. I mean, you know, if you share that with us, we'll put it on the learning innovation website sure. so that everyone can have access to that. Yeah. I think I saw I saw lots of hands showed up. How about over back to this side over here? Mm. Uh, we have oh, you've got one. Go Sorry, back. we'll go back. We'll start back. I promise I'll come to you. Hi, thank you so much for the uh, really interesting talk. Yeah. Uh, I'm a student in, that does interdisciplinary research. Awesome. So here, if you are a researcher that has a specific outcome for your test, so in this case, an activated hippocampus, and then you have a student that is taking a test but then also does poorly on the test, but you know that they have an activated hippocampus, you know that they're engaged. Yeah. Uh, if you're not meeting your education goals, how as a researcher do you develop ways to then still engage with the student and still reach those academic goals? Mm. That is a really interesting question. Say just a tiny little bit more so that I'm sure that I am understanding. Sure, so let's say you have a, a student in a math class. Mm -hmm. Let's say that they are engaged in learning, so right. they have this activated hippocampus, and you mm -hmm. think that this will lead to improved test scores. Mm -hmm. They take the next test and the test goes poorly. Mm -hmm. Then how do you redevelop your research strategies and your engage engagement strategies to then get the student to then achieve a higher test score on the next test? I see. So. So where I'm, where I'm, um, where you're being a learning engineer, which is very exciting, is that you're asking about how does how does the researcher change his or her question in order to influence a problem of practice, which is the um, the challenge for how do we get that kid to perform better on a test, right? Um, I think I think it's a multifold answer, um, and I think that the primary thing to understand is that um, there are multiple things that would go into um, how that kid is performing on the test, right? So a lot of us know the um, really devastating research around if you remind a girl of her girlness right before she takes a math exam. So not even, not even explicitly activating our cultural stereotype that girls are bad at math, but just reminding her that she's a girl can actually plummet her performance on a math exam because it activates this stereotype which then captures her attention or you know takes up her attention which then doesn't allow that attention to be available to either learning something or performing well on the math test um, so I would um, I would I would hope that a lot of the um, as a researcher it wouldn't just be okay um, we tried something and it didn't work in this in the student so we have to Completely refine our research model. Um, it would be it would be it would be great if we could start to really, in a in a very kind of deep way, to understand all of the different factors that went into that low performance for the student, um, and then have that um, be the thing that guides the research um, questions. So again, really multidimensional answer, which we can talk about a little bit more af afterwards. But um, it's a it's a it's a great mindset. <laughs> it's a, it's an incredible feedback loop that you're engaging in. Awesome. 
right. I think we have one time for one more, maybe one or two more. Well, but we have one right here. Okay, so I promised I would go here, and then we will do. Then, then we'll go there, and then sorry, we're going to have to. I'll keep my I'll mm -hmm. keep my answers short. So I'll ask a shorter question than I would have. But thanks, <laughs> that was, it was enlightening and, and really informative. One of the things I learned is I'm apparently a learning engineer and didn't know it. <laughs> so um, I'm developing a music education startup, working with a school district of Philadelphia. We're piloting it with kids, and we're trying to extend the sort of temporal and spatial limitations of the classroom Sorry. so that they can use. Uh, internet connectivity to learn outside of the framework of when they're when they're in school with very limited resources for music education and there's been a lot of research on music and the brain and I was wondering if you can talk at all or if it's just out of your purview <laughs> about how music might um, actually activate multiple centers of the brain or, yeah. or whether music is particularly important or whether that's just people who are interested in music <laughs> think it's particularly important. Well, you happen to have one of the world's experts on music and learning here, so <laughs> that would definitely be a young Mu answer. Hmm. We can talk more, because <laughs> I, I could talk about this for hours. Um, look forward to that. Okay, and we had one more over here. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for coming. I have a quick question. I'm an educator, and um, I want to know, I like to be very social with students when I'm teaching in a high school environment. So is learning increased when the educator is more interesting, as perceived mm -hmm. by a majority? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> That was not where I thought you were going to go with that question. <laughs> um, but so in terms of interest, so interest um, promotes engagement. Engagement promotes, often promotes deeper, deeper learning. Um, not always. Um, sometimes you're interested in things that you're not, um, that you're not supposed to be learning, <laughs> right? Um, and so in that sense, you know, we want to make sure that we're really targeting our engagement strategies. Um, but you bring up a really interesting um, part of that, which is, and particularly for the adolescent brain, so as, as an adolescent brain goes through puberty, um, so we know that puberty causes this massive remodeling of the body, right? Well, the brain is inside the body, <laughs> so it's undergoing this massive remodeling as well. Um, and part of that remodeling is that it actually um, creates this, this, what's called developmental mismatch, where um, the parts of the brain that are um, getting the kids really interested in social dynamics and understanding that they live within a tribe and understanding their place within the tribe, that gets really highly activated um, during the onset of puberty. What is, gets activated much more slowly is their kind of control systems around that, <laughs> right? Um, and so they're, you know, they have this, you know, much more social orientation and um, some, you know, reduced ability to kind of exert control over that system. It's actually evolutionarily appropriate, right? Because it causes increase in the survival of the species. <laughs> um, and but the the point is. During, during puberty, the brain is much, much, much more attuned to social dynamics. So anytime you can bring in any sort of social engagement, um, whether it's with you, whether it's between you know, peer, peer um, interactions, it, it can activate the social brain. And that is a really powerful learning mechanism. And even if you get them to perspective take on um, you know, what somebody else is thinking, that um, activates something called the social encoding advantage. Anyway, there's all sorts of things um, around kind of social learning, um, particularly in adolescence, that are really, really important. So, excellent point. Yeah. So, Melina, we always close these conversations with our very special patented lightning round. Ah. <clears throat> and so, I'm going to ask you, and I have a lot of questions lined up here, I'm going to ask you to try to limit your answers <laughs> to one sentence or even one word. Mm. One word. Are you ready? Yes. We don't have a timer here. But, <laughs> okay, but try, try to limit uh, very quick answers so I can get through these quickly. Okay, how does Google and the lessening of importance of fact-based recall affect learning? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> there, are fundamental, there are fundamental things that we absolutely have to learn in order for us to have flexible knowledge, um, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so you talked about uh, the, the absence of learning styles, but what about integrative approaches to learning, like STEAM? What is your opinion on that? Yes. <laughs> Great. Do them. All right. You get the lightning round. Okay. Um, what's the one sort of breakthrough in neuroscience that could happen maybe in our lifetimes that might answer a lot of questions around that? How are these lightning round questions? <laughs> um, learning engineering. How about that? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Uh, what is the biggest misconception about the field of neuroscience mm, that you've encountered? That we're all nerds. <laughs> 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 uh, when doing studies to increase executive function, do you believe there are transfer effects between video games and the real world? I know who asked that one. <laughs> um, I think there can be. There aren't always. And it needs to be very precisely, um, there needs to be a, a really deep understanding of what you're training in order to understand whether that's actually going to transfer. Okay. What's an example of a really good researcher practitioner partnership? Mm, or whatever. What you guys are doing. <laughs> uh, uh, how about another example? <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. How can we ensure that teacher training is memorable so that teachers can go on to make learning memorable for students? Mm, that's such a good question. Um, I think we need to employ this, the same science of learning principles in teacher preparation, teacher training. Okay. Uh, all right, this is not a short answer one, but uh, how do conversations with ed educators feed back into research and innovation? Mm. So very, uh, very slowly, to be honest, um, but most of the researchers don't actually get into the classroom and they don't understand, well, it is, it is hard to know what happens in a classroom. It's hard to know how a brain learns in a classroom if you don't talk to an educator and see what happens in multiple classrooms, multiple schools, multiple districts. This is all completely, you guys all completely understand this. It is not completely understood in the research field. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, are, are interventions that increase, that seek to increase executive function, do those impact um, all types of executive function, different, different disciplines, different mm. contexts? Uh, no, definitely not. There is, um, executive function is an umbrella term that covers a lot of different cognitive processes. Um, and there are different things that you can do to be able to inhibit your you know, physical responses to things. And that's very different from your ability to hold something in, in mind. All right, last one. Um, if what happens if we apply some of these principles, let's say in grade school education, early mm -hmm. education, and then a student enters a middle school or high school where those principles of learning engineering are not followed? Yeah. Will those, will those gains dissipate? It, it will depend, I think. I think if, if, it can, if we can ground our kids in an explicit partnership in how they learn, then that could actually matriculate beyond an environment that encourages that. Thank you for playing. Dr. <laughs> Melina Hunkerfer. <laughs> you didn't tell me about that. <laughs> we like to surprise a lot of people. So uh, please join us at our reception. Join us for some refreshment. We'd like to continue this conversation. Please follow us on the web uh, at the Excite Center website, drexel.eu slash excite. And we'll let you know about the next learning innovation thing through those, through those mechanisms. Thanks for being here tonight.